The American Israel Public Affairs Committee, depending on who you ask, <clears throat> you'll get a different answer about exactly when it was created. If you ask the now ambassador to the United States from Israel, Michael Oren, the famed historian, he will tell you it was founded about 1953. If you trundle down the street to the District of Columbia Division of Corporations and you ask for their articles of incorporation, they'll tell you it happened in 1963. If you go to the IRS, Internal Revenue Service will give you an even more confusing answer. They will say they applied for tax exempt status in 1967, got it in 68, retroactive to 1953. What's that all about? And if you ask APAC, perhaps the least reliable way to do it, they will tell you that they emerged from a boutique of pro-Israel lobbying organizations in the early 50s. So they grew out of that like a flower into a 100,000 member movement. How grassroots. The questions, however, again, that matter are these. When APAC was actually formed gives you a very good idea of why APAC was actually formed. And finding that out can let you ask questions about what does it actually do and how does it really operate? And for those of us in this room <clears throat> who are interested in challenging APAC, we can then begin to look at its strengths and its many weaknesses. And so it's no accident that there's so little information about APAC. It's a highly secretive organization. This uh, is a set of clippings from various publications. Fortune called APAC calculatedly quiet they told National Journal, one APAC official, that they like to work so that their fingerprints aren't left at the scene. And what is the scene of what? The Los Angeles Times lauds its donor secrecy. So doing research on APAC requires some pretty unorthodox methodology. And if you look on my biography, you'll see that I used to do quite a bit of that in the private sector, and it's helped a great deal trying to get behind and answer the questions. There's been relatively little actionable information about this organization until today. So I put the date of birth of the American Israel Public Affairs Committee at 1948, and I do that by following the career trajectory of Isaiah L. Kennan, who is a very interesting man. Isaiah L. Kennan worked at the United Nations during the battle for statehood as the public relations uh, go-to person for the Jewish agency, which was the government in waiting. He formed, along with four others, the Israel Office of Information to begin working on the most critical questions for the young state, securing diplomatic support, securing guns, securing money. And so Cannon began working as an employee, as a employee of the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Now, Cannon was born in Canada in 1905. He was naturalized a US citizen in 1934, joined the Communist Party in 37, and did a number of other things later on which were instrumental to APAC's functioning, including starting an extremely important lobbying newsletter, the Near East Report, <clears throat> and uh, APAC, which he led until 1975. One of the interesting sources of information about Kennan 
is the U.S. Department of Justice. The U.S. Department of Justice was not interested in Isaiah Kennan, and he was never the subject of a criminal investigation. But Isaiah Kennan was running around with so many Israeli intelligence agents and foreign officials that by following them, Isaiah Kennan was naturally picked up in many uh, informant reports and secret reports about the doings of the Israelis in the United States. And so what we know about some of those initial strategy meetings of particular interest in 1949, where Kennan's role managing a New York office of the Israeli, uh, Israeli Information Office and localizing, turning Israeli policy objectives into American policy objectives, localizing initials for the US market, both different grassroots uh, Israel lobbying organizations and the general public. The FBI, in an 89-page report that was released on the internet last week, uh, noted that Kennan's strategy was initially set by the Israeli Minister of Foreign Affairs, by the Israeli Ambassador, and by the founder of Mossad, Reuven Shiloa, in a strategy meeting in which they passed him their most pressing concerns and said, Isaiah, we need these things done. You've been a tremendous success as the Jewish Agency's PR person. You can do this for us. Now, Kennan, in his response to this strategic directive, announced he was ready to go. And the Justice Department noted that it looked a lot like an intelligence agency operation. You have encrypted communications coming in from Tel Aviv. You have encrypted communications between Washington and New York. They looked at this, and they saw something very interesting, something possibly threatening. Now, at this juncture in his career, Kendon was a registered foreign agent under the 1938 Foreign Agents Registration Act. This is a law that was initially created to keep organizations such as the Nazi Party and Soviets who wanted to infiltrate US groups uh, from doing that successfully. Not by saying they couldn't be in the United States, but by saying that they had to openly register all of their people at the Justice Department and disclose their funding and programs. Now, as a US citizen, any of us can go down, and now we can access it on the website, all of the FARA declarations uh, of foreign agents operating in the United States. This law was designed, really, to provide uh, moderation of this kind of thing through immediate exposure. Well, this was the first problem for Isaiah Kennan and the Israeli Information Office. They were constantly being cited, such as in this example from the Justice Department, for failure to file reports completely. They didn't even notify of a gigantic operation in Los Angeles. Um, they weren't circulating their material with the appropriate disclosure stamps, which said a copy of this material was filed with the Justice Department, and it's a communication from the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They didn't want to do that, and it's pretty obvious why. If you're mounting an astroturf group, fluffy bunnies and cute kittens, you don't want any connections with the foreign power. And so that was objective number one, was severing that need to disclose to have a more effective public relations and lobbying uh, solution. And so Kennan's solution, in coordination with the Israelis, as he openly stated in his biography, All My Causes, was to leave the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs and begin lobbying as a US citizen talking to Congress, as opposed to a foreign agent talking to the State Department. And when he told the Justice Department to delist him as a foreign agent, they said, uh-uh, no. 
not if you're simply moving out into the private sector to do the same thing you've been doing for all these years for the Israeli government. And he ignored the order. He went into an outfit called the American Zionist Council, which was an umbrella group formed by the Zionist Organization of America, by Hadassah and some other groups, to pressure and uh, get policy initiatives running. But they ran into trouble quickly, too, when they were found using tax-exempt dollars for lobbying. So he formed the Unincorporated American Zionist Council for Public Affairs as an unincorporated division of the AZC and began lobbying, but he couldn't raise any money. He had to get money from Zimmel Resnick and from the guy with his eyes blacked out, um, who, some gangster funding, basically, from people who could not uh, believe that he wasn't still on the Israeli government payroll, which he was. His Near East report, in fact, was heavily subsidized by the Jewish agency. The Near East report would be delivered with a little note card, as we have at the bottom of there, saying compliments of Isaiah L. Kennan. But it wasn't compliments of Isaiah Kennan. It was compliments of the Jewish agency, which pumped $38,000 to publish 50 issues. And he did yeoman service for the Israeli government. In fact, in 1961, when Kennedy was cracking down on Israel, or beginning to crack down, for launching a clandestine nuclear arms program, he ran various issues denying that Israel could even join the club of major industrialized nations like Soviet Russia, the Atomic Club. He said, that's simply impossible. It'll never happen. And this is the kind of thing he would be promoting uh, in coordination uh, and receiving funding also from Abraham Feinberg, who scholar Avner Cohen in Israel and the Bomb recently outed as the Israeli nuclear weapons funding coordinator for the United States. And I'm mentioning this now because I'm going to circle back to this at the end. He was a fundraiser for the Wiseman Institute. He was very concerned about massively lobbying people like Glenn Seaborg of the Atomic, uh, Atomic Energy Commission. Uh, he became Wiseman Institute chairman in 1971. And this is the subject of my latest book about the movement of US funding and highly enriched uranium out of the country, but we'll come back to that at the end. Kind of a cliffhanger. So the AZC was ordered to register as a foreign agent after activists such as Rabbi Elmer Berger, the subject of an excellent book by Jack Ross, uh, began talking to the Justice Department, talking to Congress, talking to a Senator J.W. Fulbright, and saying they're taking money from overseas and lobbying with it. This is not how we want to see uh, Jewish charity funds being used. And so they were ordered to register as a foreign agent. This left Kennan adrift. He was in an unincorporated division lobbying for the AZC. What could he do? Well, six weeks later, he filed incorporation papers in the District of Columbia six weeks after the foreign agent registration demand. And while the AZC continued to fight, arguing that the Foreign Agents Registration Act doesn't apply to Israel, it was meant for you know, other people, other countries, but not Israel, Kennan began, Kennan began launching and re, uh, reconstituting the AZC, essentially. There was a Senate investigation, which was launched in 1961, because the Senate Foreign Relations Committee was worried about being subjected to Levant-style provocations in the Middle East, which would force the US to act. This is a secret memo that was declassified in 2010. Walter Pincus, who's with the Washington Post now, but was a lead investigator, looked at some of the things that were being done through the AZC and said, I think this is an example of a foreign principle writing legislation 
for the U.S. Senate. And in this case, it was about Soviet emigres. But he doesn't talk about that anymore. He swore to Fulbright that he would not. But one of the things that has con constantly revealed APAC is its insatiable appetite for US classified information. Some of you may be aware that two months ago, a State Department file about Morris Amate's acquisition of Hawk missile data, which almost jeopardized US policy in the Middle East by driving Jordanians into the arms of the Soviets, was declassified. In 1984, AIPAC, in coordination with the Israeli Ministry of Economics, took a classified document full of trade secrets and used it to negotiate a free trade agreement and thwart opposition lobbying. In 2004, Keith Weissman, Stephen J. Rosen were indicted for espionage. AIPAC has a well-established record of seeking secrets so that it can front-run US policy and shape it. And so one of the things that I think is, is horrible is that this isn't taking down a website. Okay, We all laughed about that this afternoon. What APAC did when it took the trade secrets of 70 plus organizations and used them to lobby against them was disenfranchise the US Bromine Alliance of Arkansas, who didn't want to compete with a foreign state owned operation. They de disenfranchised the AFL CIO. They disenfranchised small tomato canners by taking their data and using it against them. And some of the most prominent figures and talking heads, such as Martin Indyk, and uh, Stephen J. Rosen, well, maybe not him so much. Douglas Bloomfield, constantly in the Jewish Telegraphic Agency. They were all involved in this. The FBI files have been declassified. So what penalty did they ever suffer for taking this data and using it against the owners? Nothing. And why did they do it? For a $10 billion prize. US-Israeli trade, before the trade preferences were granted, used to be roughly equal. Now it's a $10 billion a year deficit to the United States, uh, and it's basically a subsidy. And so it was worth it for them to take that data and win passage of that unfavorable trade legislation. So what are APAC's strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities? It's an interconnected organization with 53 other organizations on its executive committee. And that's the Conference of Presidents of Jewish Organizations. It's obviously got a campaign finance network that it's constantly signaling and has been in court because of improper signaling. It's essentially got diplomatic immunity for information trafficking and secrecy trafficking, heavy establishment media influence, a single issue fo uh, focus, and the things we talked about in terms of secrecy. So what are its weaknesses? Wow, these are all of the regulatory failures that I don't even want to go over because we're five minutes till the end. They have effectively, think about Wall Street before the crash, effectively captured the US Department of Justice when it comes to any sort of accountability. The US Justice Department has had failure after failure after failure when it comes to enforcing a modicum of you know, proper oversight of this organization. They've effectively achieved today de facto immunity. So where can we find <clears throat> places that we can exploit some weaknesses? APAC is more and more becoming publicly perceived as a foreign agent, an organization that exclusively advances the interests of a foreign state. End of story. Its PR frameworks are being challenged from many different sides. And there's some people here who do that particularly well, like Philip Weiss. Illegalities and dirty tricks have been exposed online. So when a former APAC director, such as Josh Block, tries to smear a couple of prominent people, like MJ Rosenberg, and get them fired, 10 years ago it would have worked. Now that we have the internet, it doesn't work because it's exposed. It's also been exposed because one of its biggest insiders, Stephen J. Rosen, is suing the organization for defamation. He sued them for 
$20 million, the board of directors of APAC, for telling the public that his behavior in secrets, secrets trafficking did not comport with their standards. <laughs> and we went to the last uh, courtroom drama in this saga and heard Rosen's lawyers telling the judge, APAC doesn't have any standards. And it could cost them $20 million. And there's a lot of room for getting involved through amicus briefs and helping keep that alive. That could cost APAC $20 million. So there are all sorts of weaknesses that APAC has that go beyond direct action. And so opposition research is key to challenging this large and powerful organization. Public education sessions, such as this one, formal statements of indictment, where you go to the IRS, not quietly, but loudly and publicly, and say, this organization is not a charity. It has no charitable purpose. You go to the DOJ, and you say, why aren't they registering? They were part of an organization you already ordered to do that in 62. You go to the Office of Congressional Ethics, and I had the pleasure of doing that with Medea Benjamin a couple of months ago, and you say, why is APAC taking people to Israel when all of the other lobbies can't do it? Court interventions I already mentioned. So let's circle back to the Wiseman Institute. APAC has been promoting at its most recent events, the Wiseman Institute. According to a Pentagon-sponsored IDA study, the Wiseman Institute scientists have developed cutting-edge high-energy physics and hydrodynamics programs to uh, make better nuclear bombs. The Wiseman Institute has advanced message, uh, methods for enriching uranium. They have the second largest supercomputer network in Israel, and those are used for designing nuclear weapons. Here's a video that was shown at the 2010 APAC convention lauding the Wiseman Institute. There's executive overlap with the Wiseman Institute. And this organization has the gall to talk to America about secret weapons programs. It has the gall to lecture the United States about uh, secret trafficking of uh, weapons of mass destruction. So APAC once told us, in the voice of Stephen J. Rosen, how it must be dismantled. A lobby, he said, Sam J. Rosenberg, no less, is like a night flower. It thrives in the dark and withers in the light. And so the key for all of us is to continue shining ever brighter lights to quell this unwarranted influence and tell America what it's really doing and begin challenging it strategically and with good opposition research.